Mr. Brooks, let's step back from digital assets and blockchain for a moment. Let's talk about where the internet was, where it's come to, where it's going, right? We're trying to level set here for policymakers. So originally, the internet was a read-only format, in essence. We're consuming information. And then there's additional layers that we place on. It became much more interactive. But counterintuitively, much more interactive, but much more centralized in Web 1, Web 2. What we're hearing now is Web 3. Policymakers need to understand the nature of Web 3. This is a hearing about a component of Web 3. Now, along those lines, what are the characteristics that defined Web 1 and Web 2? Mr. McHenry, thank you very much for that question. I think that's critical to understanding what we're all trying to build here. <clears throat> so the characteristic of Web 1, if people remember their original AOL account, was an ability to look in a curated walled garden at a set of content that was not interactive but was presented to you on AOL the way that Time Magazine used to show you the articles they wanted you to see inside of their magazine. Just you could see it on a screen. The innovation of Web 2 was that suddenly you could not only read content, but you could also write content. This is when the blogosphere became a, a big thing. People remember this from the late 90s, the early 2000s. <clears throat> the reason for the centralization of the internet, of course, was that all of that activity was being monetized by a very small number of companies. Facebook, as the chairwoman, as chairwoman mentions, Google, and two or three other companies. What makes Web3 different is the ability to own the actual network. And that's what crypto assets themselves represent, is an ownership stake in an underlying network. So when you hear people talk about, for example, layer one tokens, what they mean is, this is your reward for providing the ledger maintenance services, the computing power to the network, that on web one and two was done by Google, right? So now people in my hometown of Pueblo, Colorado can actually own the Ethereum network, but they can't own the internet. That's owned by Google and a few other companies. That's what the project of crypto is all about, is allowing people to directly own the networks that are, have native assets that are supporting it, and that's the nature of decentralization, where the token holders are the people who control the asset, okay, so not the Google. Token holders, for, for our language here on the Hill, those are digital assets, right, which are the keys to open up the ledger for you to participate, right? right. So describe to us how those digital assets fit into this internet revolution, Web3. So, so, so the concept is that you have sort of application layer tokens and you have protocol layer tokens. So if I'm an owner of Bitcoin, let's say that I'm a miner of Bitcoin, somebody who actually creates Bitcoin. The Bitcoin is the reward I receive for doing the work to keep the network operational. And that allows me to own a piece of the Bitcoin blockchain. Or take Ethereum, which is easier to understand. The Ether token represents an ownership stake in the network but on top of that network are all kinds of apps that get built on the network, much like the apps on your phone depend on the underlying network existing that lets the phone operate. And so people will make judgments about which network is likely to win, and they will invest in the tokens in that network much the same way you might invest in Google stock because you think Google is gonna scale access to the original internet. The difference being here, you can vote on what happens in the future of a proof of stake network, for example. You can get rewarded through a proof of work token for maintaining a ledger on something like Bitcoin. But the real message here is that what happens on the decentralized internet is decided by the investors versus what happens on the main internet is decided by Twitter, Facebook, Google, and a small number of other companies. Okay, so getting this, this layer of, on digital assets right, for Congress to understand this, everything is built upon that uh, that uh, that uh, on-ramp to this new internet. So very important for us to be sensitive to how this de develops and any actions we take in terms of uh, laws and, and updating laws to incorporate these new technologies. Yeah, uh, Mr. McHenry couldn't agree more, and, and I think when you hear about all of the problems of different big tech companies, the importance of an owner-controlled network becomes clear. Okay, owner-controlled network rather than a cooperative right, and, yes. and thinking in those terms, Absolutely. right? So if you're not a part of management, you're not making a decision in Web 2. If you are a participant in the network, you're, you're making, uh, you're cooperating in the making of those decisions. E exactly okay. right. So I ask this not to be insulting to the panel, 
but to have a level set here so we have an understanding of what we're talking about. This is not simply <clears throat> about you on this panel. It is about trillions of dollars of assets that did not exist before Satoshi wrote his white paper 13 years ago. It's about $3 trillion in, in notional value at this stage around the development of a whole new range, a whole new suite of technology that will be developed across the globe, whether or not the United States embraces it and wants to compete or if it's pushed offshore. So as policymakers, we need to understand what we're talking about here. This is a small panel, important as you may be, a small panel about the discussion about Web3. And so with that, Madam Chair, thank you uh, for having this hearing, and I hope that we can have more understanding by policymakers about these important concepts. Thank you, Mr. Brooks. Thank, thank you. you very much. The gentlewoman from New York, Mrs. Maloney, who is also the chair of the House Committee on Over